hello listeners and welcome back to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host, I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me for our weekly chat on geopolitics and markets is Rob Larity, our chief investment officer. Uh, I'm on the road for the next three weeks. I'm recording to you from my sister's house in Monroe, Georgia today. Uh, I will be recording from outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin next week and outside of Madison, Wisconsin the week after that doing a, a corporate presentation next week and then um, a presentation at the Professional Dairy Producers of Wisconsin Conference the week after that outside Madison. So if you're in Milwaukee or Madison, you want to get in touch, drop me a line, jacob at cognitive.investments. That's also where you can email me if you want to learn more about what we do at CI, about some of our investment strategies, how to become a client, if you want to sign up for our knowledge platform, if you just want to tell me what you had for breakfast or an interesting guest that I should have on the podcast. If any of you out there know any experts on Mexican democracy or Mexican politics, I'm looking for a guest to talk about that particular topic. I've got a couple leads out, but um, if anybody out there is an expert on that or knows any experts, please feel free to connect me. That would be great. Um, Other than that, cheers. Stay safe. See you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Uh, good morning for once, Rob. You're in Boston. I'm in the middle of Nowheresville, Georgia. We're both in, in foreign territories for our usual locales. Yeah, it's bright and early and dark and gloomy here. It's pretty dark and gloomy here, too. I'm, I'm doing something very dangerous for the podcast today. I have not yet had a cup of coffee, so I am somehow going to get through the next 45 minutes to one hour without being caffeinated. Have you, have you been able to tell that I'm not quite my usual perky self? <laughs> We, we, we should have brought on your last guest today. Then it would have been more fireworks as far as uh, your <laughs> your cranky disagreement. Was I cranky? Did I come off as cranky in that podcast? No, but you had coffee. I think that's the difference. Uh, I see. I see. Okay. Um, well, let's uh, pick up where um, Emily and I left off in some sense, because for me, the most important uh, news of the week was China's PMI data came out and showed that manufacturing activity in China expanded um, at the fastest pace in more than a decade. So the reading went from 50.1 to 52.6, and that is the highest PMI recorded in China since April 2012. Um, non-manufacturing was also sky high and has really levitated since December. It was That reading was 56.3. Uh, below 50 is contraction, above 50 is expansion. It's not you know super scientific, but just in general, what this is telling us is that uh, China's manufacturing complex and its economy in general seems to be revving and seems to be preparing to kick into another gear. Um, I've seen a lot of speculation out there that the Chinese economy was just waiting to get to this March uh, economic work conference. I hate arguments like that because I feel like There's a strain of China media coverage that is just always pushing off to the next meeting. So first it was the party Congress, and then it's the work conference, and then it's this stupid Congress and that stupid Congress. I think far more likely is that we've gotten through the first phase of COVID in China right now. China's open. We got through the Lunar New Year holiday. It just took a couple months for the Chinese economy to rev up. But even though I would say that I was more optimistic about reopening despite the risks and more optimistic than you... I was sort of taken aback by the PMI data. Um, And I think that that data, I'm not sure whether it's leading some of the changes we're seeing in markets or whether it's following some of the changes we're seeing in markets, whether it's dollar strength or new expectations on inflation. And we will hit all of that across the world. But um, what was your reaction to the PMI data when you saw it, Rob? Um, A few things, I guess. And, and, and first, I wouldn't say that I was pessimistic about reopening. I think I've been more pessimistic about the property side of the economy and what's going on and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but I, for me, the key takeaway is twofold on the PMI. So it was very strong. The factories are humming. And I think, number one, that reduces or degrades the argument of the bears, which is that you know, you're not going to get much of a reopening bounce. You're not going to get much pent up demand. The talk of Chinese 
excess savings that has built up over this time period is a bit overblown and you're not going to get this sort of revenge spending as as people are terming it like you saw in the US and and in the developed nations after covid um so far this doesn't this doesn't support that view this is mm-hmm. supporting a more optimistic view about people going out spending money um and in that sense it's it's a good thing the other um takeaway that i would have which i think is a less obvious one is what does this say about the US inventory cycle because you have to remember, you know, when we think about the different macro forces going up and down in different parts of the world, recently we've had a real, you know, depressing force from inventories in the US and US retailers buying up stuff from Chinese factories to fill their stores is a major driver of global growth. So heading into the second half of the year, uh, US retailers had a lot of inventory. And a lot of that was because they were looking back at the 2021 holiday experience, which was a disaster, where a lot of them couldn't get inventories that they needed. They couldn't get holiday related stuff until after the holiday, which, yep. you know, if, if you're looking to have like a fruitcake uh, in February, it's not exactly something that, um, that appeals. Uh, so there's very seasonal stuff. So there was a disaster in 2021 and a lot of them, um, we put this on the knowledge platform way back in June because there was a piece about Hasbro that was buying up inventory for toys for the holiday season, like two quarters earlier than they usually do because yeah. they were concerned about this. So anyway, um, US retailers came into the holiday period, the second half of 2022, loaded to the gills with inventory and had been, and and we could see this by the way, because we do on the ground field research and our team is taking pictures of stores with clothes and stuff just piled up everywhere. So this is a real tangible thing. This isn't just uh, academic. Um, So at the same time that expectations were, hey, we could be headed into a US recession because of what interest rates have done, businesses had a lot of inventory on their hands. So as a result, you saw new orders for these factories in China at the same time that you had COVID shutdowns you know, depressing things even more, really plummet through the floor. So the cost of shipping collapsed, um, new orders collapsed. And, um, you know, for example, the number of blank sailings, as they say, so basically cargo ships going over to China and not even bothering to stop, just (laughs) just idling because it's not worth it to even go into the port. Those spiked to multi-year highs. Basically, the whole supply chain of making stuff and bringing it to the U.S. ground almost to a halt. So that was the situation that we were in heading into this year. And now you have Chinese reopening. You have evidence that the factories are are surging again. And you have a, a, a much more optimistic viewpoint on the part of U.S. retailers and you know economy watchers with regard to the U.S. consumer. And if you look at the early sort of guidance that U.S. companies are giving for 2023, it's fairly optimistic. No one is out there saying anymore, hey, we really expect the consumer to roll over or a big recession. So their confidence is up and they've been working down their inventories and now they're probably going to have to refresh, especially when you think about seasonal inventories going into the spring, stuff around you know, housing, renovation, all the sort of springtime stuff that you usually have to build and and sell, you know, uh, a few months in advance. Now, that was a very long-winded and kind of boring path through the U.S. inventory cycle. But the point is that when you think about inflation and goods inflation in particular, which has been relatively subdued compared to services inflation, which everyone is focused on, um, you could really see a surprise to the upside there on the goods side because demand appears to be surging. And I think that's the takeaway from this PMI number. Is there any silver lining to the fact that we are dealing with a slightly different China now, which is that China's gotten through the worst of the first phase of COVID? Um, I I actually said this in a webinar I did earlier this week for Northern Crop Institute, that there's something, um, poetic was the adjective I used. I'm not sure that that's the right adjective, but there's something universal in the Chinese experience of COVID-19 in the sense that we're all the same and that 
you can only lock down people for so long, like put your political blinders aside on whether lockdowns were good or bad. Human beings are meant to be in community with each other. And at a certain point, the Chinese people wanted to be in community with each other. They wanted to travel on the New Year holiday. They wanted to go out and do things. And that mattered more to them than hospitals even being overrun or you know, elderly people who haven't been vaccinated being exposed to the to the virus. Um, but I'm, I'm saying all that to say, um, is there any silver lining um, in the fact that China has gotten through that first phase of COVID? It's more business as usual um, in China, not just business as usual in China, but also that the Chinese government seems to be putting aside diplomatic spats to the extent it can. The example here I'm thinking of is with Australia. You know, China energy demand, power demand is up. And so they're importing Australian coal. It's no more like, hey, you were mean about Huawei and you were mean about this, that, and the other thing. Give us your coal and give us your cotton and give us everything else. We want to import everything. We want people back at the factories. Does that help at all? Or does the fact that there's more slack there, like even drive inflation higher because they can take more space for orders? How, how do you read that? I think it definitely helps. Um, you know, one of the big debates around Chinese households is always, well, they always have a lot of savings. They always have a lot of excess savings relative to um, the US or Europe because they have to save for a lot of contingencies that the US, uh, that US households don't. So healthcare coverage is not good, for example. Uh, they don't have the same access to social services, especially if they're a migrant to an area where they don't have a residence permit. So they need to maintain higher savings. So anything that reduces the fear of the future is good for uh, Chinese household spending because, you know, to the extent that they expect things will be normal, that we're not heading into some kind of, you know, crazy uh, uh, period of geopolitical volatility or we're going to get in a, in a fight with one of our neighbors or, you know, I'm really concerned that if I go out, I could get really sick and even die from COVID. You know, all these sort of crazy, volatile things in the world, the more they get compressed and the more it feels like business as usual, the more people will ease up and and spend more than they would otherwise. But that's bad from an inflation perspective. I mean, in some ways, what you're saying is that Chinese demand could compete with Western demand for Chinese goods. I mean, that's sort of the dream of of the Chinese Communist Party for years right now. But part of what you're outlining there to me to me sounds like, well, if there's increased Chinese Chinese demand for some of these goods, like maybe that demand starts to eat into Western demand. Does that drive up goods inflation even more? I was sort of thinking of it in terms of maybe China's factories humming at 110% means good things for inflation in the West. But the picture you just painted sort of suggests the opposite. Um, there's always supply and demand factors, but yeah, I think it increases the risks that inflation, um, ends up higher than otherwise expected. And this is something we've been talking about for the last month or so, which is when we talked about being bullish on the dollar, bullish or hawkish on us rates, just this notion that Chinese reopening is going to primarily be a demand bolus for the world. Um, and that's starting to to play out. And yes, there's a supply element there, but really it's the demand factor that's going to be the dominant one, I think. Um, and I joked yesterday, this is kind of half tongue in cheek, as I said, that, you know, give it six months and the political uh, uh, message in the US will be those damn Chinese, you know, they're competing for us for the televisions and the refrigerators that, that we want. And they're driving up prices for American consumers. You know, I, th that wouldn't be out of the question if you saw that kind of narrative emerge, I think. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's already contributing to higher than expected inflation in certain areas. And I think that's the trend that we would expect to see for the next few months, at least. Well, speaking of freezers, update on my freezer for the audience, because I know that they're just waiting with bated breath to know what the developments are. Uh, the dealer finally was able to substitute a freezer that she was going to give to somebody else to put in in place to replace our defective freezer because they had construction delays on their project so they couldn't get the freezer in on time so it's not that the freezer supply chain has gotten any better and it was going to take they couldn't even give me a date for how long it was going to take to to replace the freezer but i managed to steal somebody else's freezer and so far it's working so uh the freezer supply chain is still really bad even though i finally have a functioning freezer in my house congratulations to me um enough of of uh, freezer gate 2022 though um, 
I guess just the last thing to, to add there before we sort of hop on the inflation segue and move over to Europe a little bit, which is you're right, we have been talking about dollar strength and inflation expectations here for a month. But I actually thought the Chinese PMI data, at least for me, I was buying that argument. But for me, the Chinese PMI data sort of stopped me in my tracks and made me think inflation was going to go even higher and that the, the dollar had even more room to run. I know you were looking at some charts that showed um, dollar strength was already uh, walloping some of the, I forget what you, what did, did you call them? What what kind of economies did you call them? I'm forgetting the, the word that you used that I made fun of. But tell us about how dollar strength has um, has gone after some of those peripheral economies that took advantage of dollar weakness and that narrative in the last couple of weeks and which is starting to turn over. Yeah, peripheral is a nice euphemism for them. Well, yeah, um, I'm, I'm ever the diplomat, <laughs> but... Uh. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we were... We were uh, we've been making the case that the dollar seems likely to to rebound again sharply as some of these factors, the Chinese reopening and so forth, pl- you know, plays into the global economy. And as the U.S. economy reaccelerates, which is we are seeing evidence of that throughout the second half of last year. So um, earlier this year, as the dollar had pulled back and the euro had surged and foreign currencies had surged, that's when you saw really the most volatile, the most kind of shaky economies, emerging economies in in particular, their equity markets just absolutely ripped. So if you look at a country like Malaysia or Thailand or the Philippines, not to pick on Southeast Asia, um, but all of those really, you know, outperformed the rest of the world, really, really ripped. And since you've seen kind of in the last three or four weeks, this dollar turnaround, so the, the euro as we said, was going up, up, up against the dollar. Everyone's all bulled up on the euro. And then wham, you know, the euro had this big reversal day and has since been bleeding down as the dollar strength has reasserted itself. And this sort of outcome that we that we spoke about actually becomes realized. And what you've seen since then is all of those kind of laggard countries have been absolutely slammed. So Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, their equity markets have given up everything that they had gained and and in some cases even more, partly because of the currency effect, but partly because the currency feeds into the equities and there's sort of this self-reinforcing process. So um, so dollar strength is not good for the emerging world as, as we've talked about in the past and you're seeing that reassert itself again now. And not good for U.S. exporters, too. And one of the points I've been trying to make to audiences is that, you know, the, the dollar has more room to run. Like, yes, the dollar had quite quite a good year in 2022 relative to most other currencies in the world. But if you zoom back and look at where the dollar was, say, in the 70s and 80s and things like that, like um, if during times of geopolitical volatility, people still want dollars. Like for all the faults of the U.S. government and U.S. politics and doubts that people have about America's role in the world, the dollar is still the king there. So there's lots of room up for, for the dollar to go. Um, when you were talking about um, the euro there and you, you finished with your wham, I, I could I, I felt like I was listening to John Madden and I wanted to get you like a little marker on the screen so you could be like wham and I could be like, you know, Pat Summerall sort of dry. Well, thank you, John, for that. But uh, let's we, we can leave my jokes aside too. Tough acting to Um But let's move on over to, um, to Europe. Um, kind of difficult times for Europe. Um, and I've been, you know, you were talking about how Southeast Asia, those were some really good performing economies. I mean, since the lull of September, October, in some of these European markets, I mean, German stock market, the Polish stock market has been screaming, Irish stock, like all of these European stock markets have been doing fairly well. But um, if you look at growth numbers, um, Europe was actually beating the United States in terms of growth numbers last couple of quarters. That looks like it's starting to flip over. Um, real wages I saw in Germany, uh, declined significantly last year, the sharpest rate that they fell in 15 years. If you compare that to the United States, um, wages like nominal wages in the U.S. have actually been going up considerably. Real wages in the U.S. are flat, maybe a little bit up if you want to be optimistic about it. But still, that's a little bit up versus sharpest drop in 15 years. But you get all that and then you get inflation reporting from some of these European countries today. The one that I have up in front of me is Germany with inflation of 8.7% uh, in February and a 23% rise in energy prices and a 20% rise uh, in food prices. I know that you had France in front of you as well. Uh, 
feels like inflation in Europe might actually be taking a bite out of the apple here and that things might not be going so well for Europe. So tell me what you're seeing on, on the European side and why that's um, catching your eye. Yeah, so there's the inflation side of things and then there's the underlying demand side. And I think those are two different aspects of the problem. So what happened this week and contributing to European underperformance was uh, inflation came higher than expected in basically all the countries that reported, France, Spain, Germany, etc. And um, now investors had been pricing in that the ECB would end its rate hikes around 3.5%, which would be the highest that it's ever done or match the highest that it's ever done going all the way back to 2001 or 2002. And after this data coming in, the markets are now pricing in that the ECB is going to raise as high as 4%, which would be a real departure from where things have been previously. So you see, you know, nominal rate expectations tightening, tightening, tightening. Um, that's the inflation and the monetary side. The, the other side um, that I've been focused on is, you know, we've talked a lot about European investment, European stimulus programs, European um, you know, a, a cohesion around the need to build and upgrade parts of the economy that are lagging in order to be competitive. And um, I think you're seeing a lot of lagging on that front as well, and a lot of squabbling, which, you know, I, I think you could probably speak to um, uh, better than I can, but that's somewhat tied to the inflation and the rate expectations, but also it's tied to sort of this feeling of normalization a little bit, like we've talked about, like the war is far away, things aren't as crazy, the energy crisis isn't such a crisis after all, um, those sorts of things. So putting those two things together, I think it's a it's a bit of a one-two punch for people who are really optimistic on Europe, which we have been, obviously. Yeah, I'm feeling much more sober, at least on the short-term time horizon, because um just because we got through the worst of the energy crisis again, that was always a relative argument. People were talking about, you know, Europeans were going to be in the streets burning cardboard in in trash cans just to keep warm for the winter and people dying in their homes because they weren't going to be able to heat their homes. That was the the narrative that we were calling out as completely, completely ridiculous. Now, we didn't expect this. I mean, I hate using the word unprecedented, but it was pretty unprecedented. An unprecedented unprecedentedly warm winter in Europe meant that energy demand was fairly low and you added that in with cuts that the governments were able to make to increase efficiency. You, know, you had energy demand was okay and you started filling up storage um, and things were going okay. The flip side is though that we're now experiencing the other side of that warm winter, which is uh, levels on the Rhine River, super low, lower than their 2018 to 2022 lows. Uh, I think France, what, hasn't had rain in 32 days or 33 days. It's the it's the longest consecutive no rain during the winter, I think, um, season in France in quite some time. I, I, I think I, I read a century. I'm not sure if that's completely right. But you're starting to worry about France's wheat crop and some of France's agricultural crop. Um, and that also, you know, doesn't just because that Europe got through last winter okay because it was, was the weather was super warm what if you get a situation where it's super warm and super dry and that's bad for agriculture and bad for food and the shortages that you're seeing in UK you know supermarkets are going to move to the rest of Europe and then what if you got a cold winter this year before any of the energy spending has really coming come in before a lot of that LNG capacity has come online so th there's a version of this that goes really really badly for Europe over the next 6 to 12 months because even an optimist would say, well, none of the infrastructure they were going to build, it wasn't going to happen in 2023. It wasn't going to meaningfully in, uh, impact the market. 2024, if you were an optimist, and more 2026, 2027, if, if my, like me, you're more of a pragmatist slash realist. So you put all of those things together. Um, I'm beginning to think the narrative on Europe got a little ahead of itself. And then the, the sort of coup de grace to that is, okay, and now inflation's going up in Europe too, and the ECB is going to come in and raise interest rates because I guess that's what central banks do when they think they're problems. You just come in and you raise interest rates and you think that that's going to make everything better. So that constellation of things um, doesn't look particularly good for Europe from my perspective. And I, the last thing is you hit on this too. The war has been normalized. The war is not normalized. Like the war is still happening. The war could get significantly worse. Um, and we'll back into this to talk about 
some global ag issues and and the Black Sea Grain Initiative and what's happening there. But there's just so much complacency um, in Europe after after so much doom and gloom that um, you know I'm I'm feeling pretty chastened about what the next six to eight months brings. Even though I was much more optimistic in September October and sort of rode that wave upwards. And just to piggyback on that, because there's something that I find a little puzzling about about Europe and what Mr. Market is telling us, which is despite what we just said, despite the fact that the euro had been ripping in conjunction with European and international stocks, and since then it's been bleeding off, despite all that, peripheral European stock markets are on fire. Uh, Italian Mm. stocks just made a new high against the S&P. They're, they're, um, they're making a new one year high. Greek stocks are going absolute, absolutely bananas. French stocks are on fire. You know, Germany is not so good. Uh, let's, let's see Spanish stocks also on fire, making a new testing the 2021 highs right now. Mm. Spanish this, I'm looking at the Spanish ETF. I don't have the IBEX in front of me here. IBEX is making a new high going back at least for the last few years. So that's really weird. Mr. Market is telling us something positive about those peripheral economies in particular. And I wonder if it's looking out to more Euro weakness, like like Mr. Market's interpreting Euro weakness as a very positive element for these economies. Um, Because remember, like travel is booming. Tourism is 12% of Greece's GDP alone, which is a huge number. Um, and the other peripheral countries are similar. So I wonder if there's an you know export of services element to this, but it's not a one-way picture for sure. And it's a bit of a puzzle. Well, I mean, some of that might be Americans, you know, traveling abroad. Um, Side note, have, have you been forced to watch White Lotus or have you been following the White Lotus thing? Phenomenon? I've been pitched, I've been pitched on it, pitched on it many, many times in the last yeah, few I was, weeks. I, I, my, my beautiful wife, Megan, uh, got me down to watch and the first season was fine, but the second season is set in like Sicily or something and I can't get through it. It's, it's, I don't understand why people like it so much. It like literally makes my skin want to crawl. Um, but I was thinking of that because if you're saying that the peripheral European countries, maybe all these uh, European or excuse me, all these American tourists and uh, people from other places want to go there. Uh, the weird thing about the peripheral countries, though, that you're you're saying also is that not all of those countries are created equal. It's strange that Italy would be rising as much as it is. I mean, it's going to be the largest benefactor from the EU next generation recovery fund. So it does have that going for it. But they are really exposed to some of the energy issues in, in Russia and to German supply chains and things like that. Greece, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say about Greece. Like that, that's that they'll be paying more debt than their GDP is worth out to because of you know austerity out to twenty sixty or something crazy. Spain is the interesting one because Spain uh, really invested in energy infrastructure before everybody else in Europe, and they're the ones that are sort of in, um, inoculated from some of this Russian spillover. So I don't know that all those are created equal. I think another thing to point out though is that usually in times like this where there's a lot of uncertainty in Europe, that German Italian bond spread starts to really um widen and the the german italian bond spread is not it's not particularly wide right now i mean i I haven't looked at it in the last week or two but it was at a it was at an eight month low sort of in mid-january when this narrative started to turn so i think that's that i think you're right also that mr market seems to be saying something about the fact that this is germany it's the center of europe it's the portions of the economy that are maybe most exposed to this ongoing war in russia ukraine that that are maybe experiencing the most doubt. I don't know. I know that you're checking the bond spread thing to make sure that I'm right here. I, I just took a shot. And <laughs> we'll, we'll see if I, it's still right. <laughs> <laughs> no, your, your memory serves you pretty well. So yes. I think that's a really important point because uh, especially on the back of the inflation numbers that we just talked about, German bond yields are making a new, you know, basically all-time high going back for more than a decade. And yet, Italian yields are not, Spanish yields are not, Greek yields are not. All of those peaked back in mid-October. So despite, you know, what would seem to be some 
I don't know, some negative uh, developments that we talked about, despite, you know, jumping inflation, you're not seeing any evidence of stress uh, in terms of those long-term peripheral bond yields. And you're seeing the spread between them and Germany uh, tighten during a risk-off period, which is kind of interesting. Well, it's probably too fantastical to say this but the you know the eu bull in me that wants to be an eu bull in the long term wants to say aha well that's because the eu is finally going to invest in the peripheral countries over the center and it makes sense that germany would suck right now germany bet the house on cheap russian natural gas and yes they got a winter reprieve but that doesn't mean they didn't bet the house on cheap russian natural gas and it's not forthcoming unless some major change happens in the russia ukraine war so one of the points um i made in that that sit rep that outlined why I thought the European natural gas crisis wasn't going to be a crisis. I did say in that piece, but if you're Germany, if you're Slovakia, if you're Czech Republic, if you are Hungary, if you're some of these countries that are in the interior that bet big on Russia, like those are not places and industries that maybe you want to be exposed right now. So maybe that's just coming out and maybe in the long run, it's good that that Spain and, and Italy are soaking up all this interest, but it's probably a little too early for that kind of optimism. Um, Anything else on Europe before we pivot a little bit? Let's pivot. Um, I think let's pivot a little bit to some nitty gritty ag stuff and then we'll close with some thoughts on Mexico. Um, you know, I, I want to, I, I don't want to get too, well, actually, I probably do want to get a little nitty gritty here. We've been talking very high macro level point of view and now I want to dive into two particular things. But to dive into those two particular things, we also have to do a little macro narrative. Um, because, you know, in the last, uh, I guess in the last two to three weeks, we've put two new positions on CI macro. We are generally long wheat and we are short soybeans. So we think that the price of wheat is probably going to go up and we think that the price of soybeans is probably going to go down. Um, and the reason for the soybeans thing is a fairly easy, um, argument to make. It's that Brazil is sitting on this massive record crop that is just going to completely flood the market. Um, we think that all the things about renewable diesel and demand for biofuels, that's all there, but it's more of a story 2024 and beyond that maybe there's a mismatch in the market between uh, what is demand going to be for that in 23? What is this record high Brazilian crop going to mean, et cetera? So that's why we're a little bit, um, not a little bit, that's why we put on the short position with soybeans. I will say the PMI data out of China uh, was a blow to that thesis. I don't think it's I don't think it's time to take it off quite yet, but if China's going to go gangbusters and demand for commodities out of China is going to be huge, like that could give some support for soybean prices. So that's in the back of our minds. But then there's this idea that also you're going to get higher wheat prices. Um, and maybe you can talk about the technicals here, the technicals here, Rob, but I think one of the things that's happening is that the market is just assuming that everything is cool with the Black Sea Grain Initiative, that it's going to be extended automatically, that even um, that when it is extended automatically, Russia is going to stop uh, causing problems for cargoes that are trying to get through the Black Sea, that basically we didn't get this global food crisis last year and that everything went fine with the Black Sea Grain Initiative last year. So everything's going to go fine this year. And I'm not sure that's true. The Russians are out saying, hey, we're not sure we're going to extend this Black Sea Grain Initiative unless we get tangible concessions that we asked for on Russian agricultural products, on Russian fertilizer exports and things like that. And even if they do what they did in November, which was, you know, wailing and gnashing of teeth, and then they just automatically let the, the deal extend. What if they let the deal extend and they keep doing what they've been doing, which is more inspections and more delays and bombing Ukraine, you know, trying to bomb Ukraine into the last century? Um, even but you know we when we made the long wheat position in ci macro i hadn't even uncovered that um article from a, it was a ukrainian institute for research or economy and sciences i forget the exact name of it um, but they found that up to a quarter of ukraine's agricultural land has basically you know is infected with toxins or has been bombed is just not going to be suitable for growing here even if the war started tomorrow so now you're already starting with a 25 percent reduction in the land that, you know, in, in Ukraine's grain belt that can be used to grow things. So you put all those things together and you look at what's happening with wheat in general, where prices have collapsed, and maybe there's a little bit of an opportunity there. So I, I, maybe I'll just throw over those two sort of broader theses to you, Rob, and give us a little nitty gritty of why we're, we're thinking those things right now. Yeah. So this is good because it's sort of like anatomy of a trade. Um, so we can pivot from talking about our usual highfalutin stuff to the actual nitty gritty of how we put this stuff to work. 
Um, so let's take it one at a time because those are two different issues yep. and we'll talk about wheat after because then we'll pivot into the war stuff and, and those elements which are more geopolitical. So let's do soybeans first. Um, and just as a reminder, so the way that we approach actually investing, you know, and using geopolitics and other fundamental research with our investing is that we think of it like a three-legged stool. The first leg of the stool is fundamentals. So what's actually happening in the world? And that's what we spend most of our time talking about here. The second leg of the stool is market action and technicals. So what is Mr. Market saying? What is the setup? What is the risk reward as demonstrated in the prices? Um, and then the third leg of the stool is sentiment. So what does everyone else think about this thing? Um, because if you're doing something and everyone agrees with you, that could be quite risky. Um, usually you want to do things that are somewhat controversial and then later everyone agrees with you because it turns out you were right. So you're always arbitraging those three legs of the stool. So let's look at each of them. Um, you talked about the soybean setup fundamentally um, with the Brazilian crops and, and um, you know, the Argentine crop being particularly poor and the market not doing too much in response. Um, I think that's an interesting element of that. But um, the technical setup on soybeans is an interesting one because here you have soybeans um, have been really elevated. And if you ignore just sort of the spike in all commodities that you saw during the early 2002 2022 period when the war broke out and the whole com commodity complex was just you yeah. could throw a dart and make money then basically soybeans bottomed in late 2021 around twelve dollars a bushel and they've just been sort of <clears throat> moving up and to the right in a very tight and very kind of lackadaisical fashion in uh, late and, 2022 you mean right um well i'm saying before the spike Okay. They okay. bottomed in, in late 21. They spiked at the war. They pulled back to basically the uptrend line yeah. that they were already on. And then they're sort of meandering upwards um, up to the point of, you know, 1550 per per bushel. And um, I guess the takeaway there, and without getting too nitty gritty, because that's kind of boring, and this is inherently a visual thing, which if you're watching on the YouTube video, we'll put the charts on here so you can see what we mean. Um, but when something is moving in a very narrow, not volatile range and, and, and there's a big long position in it. So speculators getting to the sentiment side, everyone that we're talking to is pretty bullish on soybeans. The speculative futures position on soybeans is really quite long and quite extended. Everyone is positioned for this to go up and it's sort of bleh, not doing that much. So that is sort of the technical and the sentiment set up here. So we look for, well, what could cause the current consensus to be shattered or reevaluated? What are the risks to what everyone assumes to be true? And that gets into, you know, some of the fundamental things that you're talking about, which is if if news like, you know, very poor Argentine soybean crop comes out and the price doesn't respond, then if you're bullish, you have to be worried. Um, and maybe the market is starting to show, hey, there's this big ass Brazilian crop coming and that is really going to be the driver. Um, so that's soybeans. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. That was a quick one. No, I think that's right. I think in some ways this is an if this is right and it could it could blow up. And like I say, like China demand coming online. Um, there's also elevated demand for soybean meal, which I haven't quite been able to make sense of. But, you know, there are scenarios where this goes wrong and we're not going to be right on 100 percent of the trades. But in general, I think this is an example of people not seeing what's staring them in the face, which is a record Brazilian crop which makes up for all of the weather problems and everything else is just sitting there. And yes, there's problems in logistics from getting it from point A to point B. Brazil's crop is so big, they can't process it themselves. So you're going to have to figure out how to get it to the markets that can actually process it for it to work. But in some ways, it's just a really simple, in the same way that, you know, when, when we looked at the European natural gas cr uh, issue, we put aside all the politics, put aside all the war and said, there's enough natural gas out there that this is not going to be a problem. That doesn't, you know, the risk here is that it's not going to get from point A to point B, logistics, execution, blah, blah, blah. But the issue is not, it's not supply. Like there is enough 
natural gas out there. It's sort of the inverse here. Like there is too much, there are too many soybeans out there in 2023. And there are scenarios in which I can imagine this doesn't go well, but the sort of signal that I wouldn't ignore is that that Brazilian crop is just sitting there and something's going to have to happen with that. And with what you said about the technicals and sentiment, maybe the upside there is, is to the downside. Did I just say the upside is to the downside? See, this is what happens when I, I don't have coffee. You know what I'm trying to say, that the opportunity <laughs> is to the downside, not that the upside is to the downside. Um, that might and be you're the starting to, this, is, this is starting to sort of play out a little bit just in the last few days. So a few days after we really put this on, um, the futures, the soybean futures got whacked um, two days ago for the first time really in six months. Like previously, as I mentioned, they've been acting very sleepy. So maybe this is starting to play out. Um, we will see. Uh, wheat. Let's let's talk about that one. So that's a very different scenario. Unlike soybeans, wheat prices have been terrible um, ever since the war. So um, I'm just bringing up the chart here so I can talk to it. So, uh, wheat prices spiked to about $12, um, right around the, the breakout of the war, 12, 1250 a bushel and didn't stay up there very long. The Russian deal, uh, uh, to, to export, to allow Ukrainian export wheats out of the black sea was signed in July of 2022. Correct me if I'm wrong. Nope. Wheat prices, you know, made another rally to try to spike again in the summer of last year. And then they've collapsed since then. So they immediately went back down to eight bucks. And since then they've they've been making a new low and are currently just above seven dollars a bushel. And um the setup here is almost the opposite of soybeans. Um there's a lot of complacency in the in the bearish direction. Um, as you pointed out. People seem to assume that the status quo on the Ukrainian-Russian Black Sea Green Deal is going to remain in place. Um, the market doesn't seem to be pricing in any real risks to to the wheat uh, 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 supply, and that's sort of a setup that we think is interesting. So the 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 when we talk about the market action, you have you know wheat prices making new lows but sort of in a in a sluggish fashion just like soybean prices are moving up in a sluggish fashion uh, fashion without much momentum the sentiment is very very depressed and sort of complacent and bored with wheat and and the fundamentals you know seem to be evolving in an interesting direction you know before getting into the um into the war aspects you know i guess we could just point out that uh, you mentioned earlier that weather in Europe has been very poor. France hasn't had rain in 32 days. Um, there's already expectations that this could crimp the French wheat crop. Um, India is expecting record heat. They're preparing their coal firing uh, uh, electric plants to load up on coal because they're expecting a lot of cooling demand. Um, so you're starting to see the rumblings of like, hey, you know, it isn't all uh, tea and roses for the for the wheat supply situation, and then you have the war issue, which I, I'll let you take the baton on and, and explain sort of your thoughts. Yeah, I I hesitate to make too much out of the war because I don't want to say that it's a silver bullet. Like I don't I don't want it to get because I do think that you can already see the media narrative crystallizing around this. Like oh, if the Black Sea Grain Initiative is automatically extended, um, then everything's going to be fine because the Black Sea Grain Initiative could get extended, but exports out of the Black Sea could decline by 50%, either because the Russians do more inspections or because Turkey is completely um, you know, self-absorbed in its elections and the earthquake recovery and things like that. And Ukrainian farmland is under attack or the war. At, like, There's so many scenarios in which you could get a continuation of the grain deal and it's still not going to be um, good. By that, I mean, it's still not going to help keep the price of wheat low, that you might actually have support there for wheat prices in general. And you're absolutely right. When you start looking around the rest of the world, um, the one you, you you mentioned, India, they had record or close to record high temperatures last year. The difference this year is that it's just coming even earlier. <laughs> so it's going to suck even more. You already talked about Europe. The other thing that nobody's talking about is we're going to have a famine in East Africa, in the Horn of Africa, probably. The last time this happened, it was roughly a decade ago. 
um, you know, a quarter of a million, something like that. Somalis died in that. Um, you've got the Ethiopian, Ethiopian civil war, which has also created a lot of refugee displacement in the region itself and has not allowed farmers to plant in certain areas. Ethiopia was bragging that it was going to be a wheat exporter in the year ahead. I have trouble making sense of that con- considering everything that's gone on with it. So you start putting all the pieces on the board. All you really need is one sort of little negative nudge, one thing to go wrong in the Russia-Ukraine war, I think, to really set the narrative piece of the stool in a very, very different direction. And I mean, maybe the war will go into a frozen conflict, maybe everything will be fine. But just look at a topographical map of Ukraine and look at where the fighting forces are right now. That, to me, looks like an unsustainable situation. And Russia has every reason to try and push and to make its mobilization count and and make gains on the ground. Ukraine should maintain a defensive crouch, but they're starting to see polls in the West that say support is is slowly starting to weaken, that in the United States, we're more skeptical of supporting Ukraine, even with weapons, it's sort of 50-50 and with money, um, people don't want to be supporting Ukraine at all. So Ukraine might have to show, hey, we can actually do this. We can beat the Russians. We can beat the Russians quickly if you just give us what we need. I think that's part of the reason why Ukraine is sticking with the fight in Bakhmut, even though they probably shouldn't. They should probably withdraw and get into a more defensive crouch and just pick off Russian offensive as they go. But the politics of that uh, don't seem to be working right now in Ukraine, all of which is a way to say, does that sound like a stable conflict to you? Does that sound like a conflict in which you shouldn't expect any negative surprises over the course of the next month or two? Doesn't so- sound like that to me. So it's a bet sort of, I think, on, hey, like this is a very volatile situation. There's probably going to be something negative that happens here. And you start looking around the world for these little tiny signals and things don't, as you said, they don't look great. And they don't look great in parts of the world where you know people pay a lot of attention, like France, oh, they haven't had rain, and also in parts of the world where people are paying no attention, where you know the famine in in the Horn of Africa. I'm not. I don't want to do comparative suffering here, but you know everybody's talking about the earthquake in Turkey. Horrible, terribly tragic. Like thoughts and prayers go out to those people. But like, look at the situation in the Horn of Africa. It's absolutely terrible. It looks like a humanitarian ca- catastrophe in the making. Have you heard about that? Has that been on the front page of any newspaper that you're paying attention to? Probably not. So put all that together. It, it looks like a a promising risk reward, at least on, on the wheat trade, which as I close that sentence with that makes me sound like I'm a sociopath, but such as investing in objective geopolitical analysis. Well, I think this is a good example. Um, you know, I, I, last week when I was in, uh, in New York, I visited, uh, Columbia to give a, a talk to the short selling class. Cause my friend, uh, Jamie Lester is the, the professor there. And one of the things we talked about was, you know, how do you get an edge as an investor? And um, I made the observation that in our experience, you, you really can't get an informational edge anymore. The edge is not in getting information that others don't have necessarily. The edge is in what do you pay attention to? Mm. And this is a really good example of that, I think, because anyone can analyze these things. Um, but I don't see people paying attention to issues that aren't front and center, that aren't you know highlighted in red on the Bloomberg screen. Um, and and the war thing is a good example. Like the Ukrainian Russian deal expires two weeks from today. Um, negotiations are starting. I haven't seen anything in the Wall Street Journal. I haven't seen anything you know in the Financial Times talking about hey, here's what could happen if this fall through here scenarios is people aren't paying attention because it's there's other stuff going on um so that is that is where a lot of opportunities come from is just deciding what to pay attention to and having sort of the discipline to really dig into something that no one else cares about even though you know the inertia is to focus on the thing that everyone else cares about at at the given moment, uh, if that makes sense. It does. This was actually a lesson that I learned in grad school. It was probably the one thing useful that I learned in grad school, which was I had to do a, you know, a master's thesis or dissertation at the end of my, at the, at the end of my master's degree. And, you know, I, I, I was thinking for weeks about the topic and research and I was feeling very insecure about it. And I went to my advisor and she gave me some you know, feedback. And I realized by the third meeting with my advisor that I knew more about the topic than she did. 
Which makes sense. Her life wasn't devoted to this very arcane thing that I wanted to spend a year writing a dissertation about. But um, the dissertation has not really helped me at all in my in my professional career. But what has helped me is that realization that, oh, if you do really, really hard work for a couple weeks, like you can absolutely gain an edge on somebody who's even a self-professed expert in that field because you're looking at something very closely that nobody else has. And if you make the choice, if you're good at picking the right topics or asking the right questions, that's actually the path um, to generating interesting insights. And in some ways, the the formation of the question is far more important because anybody can go and do a bunch of research and put together an answer. It's, are you asking the right questions? Are you seeing the field the right way? Um, which I want to stick to our promise to pay more attention to Latin America. We've done a decent job so far this year, but I don't, the last couple podcasts have been very China, Eurasia heavy. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about Mexico as we close out. I think we're fairly bullish on on Mexico in general, um, but I was a little, I, I wasn't surprised by what happened with um, with AMLO's decision to push that bill through that quote unquote reforms the National Electoral Institute. He's been talking about it literally forever. Um, a little bit of background for listeners. Um, AMLO has run for president several times in Mexico, and he was defeated in 2006 by a very, very razor thin margin. So it was 36.69% to 36.09% for AMLO. And so instead of being able to become president, Felipe Calderon did, and that led to the cartel wars and a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't have to go into. Since 2006, AMLO has had it out for the National Election Institute. I don't even think it was called that. I think it was called uh, it was some it was called something else. The ins, the Federal Electoral Institute is what it was called in 2006. He has hated it since 2006. His argument has been that it is um, sort of a cloister of corruption within the Mexican state that you have to purge this last vestige of corruption so that Me- Mexican democracy can really evolve. Um, the problem with that thesis is that pretty much every single neutral objective observer that I've been able to get a paper from or been able to talk to about this says, no, actually, like the National Election Commission is objective. It maybe wasn't before like 2000, but it was in some ways created and strengthened precisely to protect and safeguard Mexican democracy. And what AMLO is doing is he's basically eliminating all the regional offices. He's slashing budget. He's doing all these things that are going to make the Electoral Commission fairly toothless um, in the next election. Now, I think people were afraid that AMLO was going to run for a second term, and he doesn't seem to be willing to And to do that. He would literally have to change Mexican law because Mexican presidents are only allowed to run for one six-year term. As an aside, I really like that. We should think about importing that in the United States, but that's neither here nor there. But he hasn't made any moves about trying to do that. But if you can defang you know, sort of independent election observers and the Morena party can start to look more like a single party that dominates the Mexican government. Suddenly we're back in the 20th century in Mexico um, with the pre, which was there was no, there was no single Mexican dictator for most of the 1900s. It was a single party authoritarian state. Yes, you had the window trapping of elections, but when elections produced inconvenient results, those were massaged and kind of moved away. And it's, it's not a good thing when a president is thinking about um, changing those types of institutions that are so supposed to safeguard elections and which seems to be what that electoral commission has done. Last caveat here is I don't want to make too big a deal out of this because the Mexican Supreme Court can and will weigh in on this and they might smack <laughs> AMLO across the face and say, no, this is not going to happen. Nice try and we'll go from there. So I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill um, and I don't want to suggest this is anything new, but that bill finally did get through um, and I do think it's, it's a little bit concerning um, about the future of Mexico. And I'm a little bit more concerned about the future of democracy in Mexico than I was um, the last time we talked. What sort of economic um, impacts do you see this having, if any? That's a much more difficult question to parse out because you can envision a scenario in which Mexican democracy doesn't do very well, but which a single party state can, you know, enact more coherent policies that may actually be better for the economy or for a trade perspective. You can also imagine, um, you know, a single party state like that, um, or, or 
even an authoritarian, having more control and more ability to say, fight back against the cartels. Democracy is not well suited for fighting a war against the drug cartels like in Mexico. There are reasons that countries like Russia and China, although they suffer in terms of human expression and creativity and innovation and all these other things, you wouldn't have like, you know, drug cartels in China or Russia running around the place because, you know, the government would fairly well eliminate those things. And one of the real contradictions of Mexico is that because of its inequality, because of its unique geography, which makes it difficult for the central government to establish its writ over the entire country, you do have these non-state organizations that do pose a major threat to the government and maybe democracy can't take them on. So I'm not saying that Mexican democracy democracy should go away. I'm just saying you can imagine scenarios in which this would actually be good for the Mexican economy. One of the reasons I'm nervous about this is when you actually go and look at polls in Mexico about support for democracy, it's not as high as you would think. I went back to 2018 for a Latin barometer study, and they found that just 37.8% of respondents felt that democracy was their preferred form of government. And then another, a higher percentage, 38%, didn't care whether the Mexican government was democratic or not. They just wanted to see you know, better policy and less violence and all these other things. So if you have AMLO, who despite everything is super popular, like he's been president for I don't know how long, he's giving amulets to Donald Trump, he's doing all these crazy things, his approval ratings are over 60%. Joe Biden, Donald Trump, all the, they would kill for approval ratings over 60%. So he's very popular, but then he's meeting this faction of the population that really wants democracy. And that's sort of the clash. When you get that clash together, um, things are not that's where I'm saying there could be a negative scenario. So even if we imagine a scenario in which um, you know, Mexican democracy not doing well is good for the Mexican e- economy, I think the more likely scenario is you're going to get this contest for the levers of power in the Mexican state. And that's not good because Mexico does need some pretty strong handed policies to attack inequality, uh, deglobalization and reshoring. Uh, the cartels, like all of these things require some pretty cohesive Mexican government responses. And if we're getting a contest for political power instead of a Mexican government that is freed up to actually focus on Mexico's problems, like all of that um, could be bad. Um, The last thing is that, you know, when you start going down the path uh, away from democracy, um, one of the things that usually happens is you get more protectionism, more nationalism, more nationalization. And this is another thing AMLO has been doing. He's been talking about national, not just talking, he did. He nationalized Mexico's lithium reserves. And he's been pushing that forward here over the past couple of weeks, like starting to say, okay, I said we were going to nationalize these lithium reserves. We need to go do that now. Where are the national companies that are going to do this? Make sure that we are doing these things that I said we were going to do from a nationalist perspective. So all of those things would be part of the negative scenario there for um. For, uh, for what I'm talking about. And I, 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 I suddenly feel, you know, Philip Tetlock, when he wrote Super Forecasters, said that fox, foxes were more accurate, but that people paid less attention to foxes because they could change their minds five times in a minute. I feel like in that answer to you, Rob, I, I just did that and I was guilty of not being very clear. But that, that at least is my attempt at an answer. Um, and one last question is, you know, you've written in the past about Mexico's geography, and we've talked about this and how difficult it is to project power to, you know, the parts of Mexico that are off of, you know, that kind of central plain where Mexico mm-hmm. City is and, and stuff like that. Does that lend itself to Mexico just working better as an authoritarian government? I'm, I'm being deliberately a little bit provocative here, but when you have geographic barriers like that, does that influence the uh, the success or not of what kind of regime you're operating with? I want to say no, but I think that's a personal preference. Um, AMLO's biggest hero in Mexican political history is Benito Juarez. And Benito Juarez was, first he was president and he sort of became dictator over a period of time. And he has, um, even though he was a dictator in Mexico, if you go on the streets, people still think fondly of Benito Juarez for a lot of different reasons. One of the reasons was because he attacked a lot of these bandits that were out attacking railroads that were being constructed outside of that central core of Mexico. And his um, ability to do that and to create like security forces that were specifically designed to go after those bandits and secure the country, I think that's part of the reason the historical memory of Juarez is better than, say, Porfirio Diaz, who like, I mean, this is a very small sample size, but when I was in Oaxaca a couple of years ago before the pandemic, I remember asking a bunch of people, hey, what do you think of Juarez and what do you think of Diaz? And everybody's like, love Juarez, Diaz sucks. They were both dictators. They both like 
sort of ruled with an iron fist, but, you know, one did things more for the greater good before he fell in love with his own megalomania. The other was sort of a megalomaniac from the start. All of which is to say, um, look, it's very difficult with that kind of geography, I think, to, especially if you have problems that are already there, um, to just kind of uh, move it away. The flip side of this, though, is look at the United States. There's nothing about American geography that would tell you that um, you know the power centers in the Northeast and the Southeast should have been able to project power across the Rockies into the American Southwest into California and things like that. Like that doesn't make sense either. That a democracy could rule all of that land. So there's something else I think here going on. I th- I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to give um, Mexico the easy way out here and say, oh, your geography means that a democracy is never really going to be able to do this. Like north of the border, you have an example of a country that did exactly that. Um, maybe it did that in ways that are not cool now, but like, you know, you, you have examples of democracies that are able to overcome their, their geography. So it's, I think that plays into it. That makes it hard. That makes the degree of difficulty of the policy move here much more difficult, but it doesn't make it impossible. And again, rooting it in Mr. Market, um, you know, we've had Mexico as a, a maximum overweight within our geopolitical filter for the longer term strategies that we do uh, with clients. Um, and I think it was a, a month ago that we talked about, you know, the mysteriously strong ESO, mm-hmm. right? Well, since we said that a month ago, the thing that's really shocking is that, as I mentioned, all the other foreign currencies are getting smacked in the last few weeks. The peso is making new highs against the dollar. The peso is making five-year highs against the dollar. The peso is beating the Canadian dollar. How about that? Um, I guess I should cancel my my next vacation to Oaxaca, huh? Oh, (laughs) jeez. And and Mexican stocks are ripping as well. Um, They're not pulling back. So something is going on that is really positive um and i'm not sure exactly what the drivers are but this is why you need to pay attention to what the market is saying because mr market is telling us something positive about mexico and you know we'll try different theses and see which one seems to fit the best Um, but you have to stand up and pay attention when you get a signal like that yeah and in some ways the signal there might be jacob stop you know, droning on about the politics, like, you know, deglobalization is good for Mexico. It means that Mexico is going to soak up all this in, uh, U- American interest that was in China before. So just like, you can talk about the politics all you want, like on a fundamental level, like Mexico is in a wonderful position from an economic perspective, and that's not going to change uh, depending on the name of the, depending on the name on the presidential office. So I take that point too. Or maybe Mr. Market just really loves AMLO's elf tweets. Yeah, that was strange too. That he's, he's twi- uh, it was actually very difficult for me because I was sitting down to like do serious analysis about the election institute. And I went to check Amlo's Twitter just to, as one of my starting points. And there he is tweeting about how somebody took a picture of what he called an elf uh, in creating some infrastructure train project that he's been talking about. And it's like, how am I supposed to do serious analysis if this dude is out here tweeting about elves? Like something, something is not right here. Um, on that note, uh, anything else to tell the listeners before we get out of here, Rob? No, let's leave on the elves. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I'm going to go find some coffee. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.